Hello, I am Seema and welcome to part 16 of the chapter Electrochemistry. In part 15, I started telling you about the variation of conductivity and molar conductivity with concentration. And we came to these relationships that conductivity is equal to kappa into area upon length and if area and length are unity, then the conductivity would be said to be the conductance would be equal to the conductivity of a solution whose area or uh, of a solution whose area of cross section and length are unity. Then we calculated that lambda m, that is molar conductivity, is equal to kappa into area upon length. Again, since we are talking of conductivity, it is the conductivity of a solution where the length is unity, but it has the area of cross section A in such a way that the uh, conductivity cell can contain one mole of the solute in it. So the length remains one, but the area according to dilution, if more dilution is there, the area increases, and if there is less dilution, the area decreases in order to have one mole of the solute. So we, I told you that if you multiply area into length and length into length, both multiply both the numerator and denominator by length, area into length becomes volume and length into length since both of them are one we can ignore it or it is assumed that it is one only or rather uh, if you do not write the denominator it means it is one so it becomes equal to kappa into volume from this we understood that as you uh, the molar conductivity it increases with increase of volume and when does volume increase when the concentration decreases when there is less concentration more volume of the solution will be required to have one mole of the solute. When the concentration is high, it means lesser volume of the solution will have one mole of the solute. So we found from here that molar conductivity uh, is directly proportional to volume and inversely proportional to the concentration. Then we also understood that when the concentration approach is almost zero, at that time, the molar conductivity is known as the limiting molar conductivity and it is represented by lambda naught m. Now, having understood this, let us move on to how, are, how is the conductivity uh, or molar conductivity of strong electrolytes affected by the change in concentration. Now, we know that molar conductivity increases slowly with dilution. Why does it increase slowly in the case of a strong electrolyte? Why does it increase with dilution? Because as you increase the dilution, the volume will increase. Uh, will, uh, with dilution, volume will increase, which means concentration is decreasing. If volume will increase, that means that molar conductivity would also increase according to this relation. Now, molar conductivity, if we want to relate it to limiting con conductivity or limiting molar conductivity, then Molar conductivity, the relation that we find is that molar conductivity is equal to lambda naught m minus a c to the power half or under root c. Now, we know that lambda naught m is the limiting uh, molar conductivity, which means that when the dilution is so much that the concentration is almost equal to zero, now the volume cannot expand any more beyond this. And that is the limiting, no more of it can be done. So it's known as limiting molar conductivity. At any point of time, the molar conductivity would be that maximum that is limiting molar conductivity minus a into c to the power half where c is the concentration and a is a is a value that depends on the nature of the electrolyte when we plot a graph using this that is when we plot a graph with concentration to the power of half against molar conductivity that is limiting molar conductivity if we plot a graph for a strong electrolyte like kcl what do we get we get a straight line this straight line has an intercept where it intercepts here would be the limiting molar conductivity for KCL and the slope is equal to the value of minus A. So you are actually uh, plotting a graph between molar conductivity and C to the power half and where it intercepts that point would be the limiting molar conductivity. So with intercept at lambda naught M value of A for a solvent will depend on the type of the electrolyte and the slope would be minus A. So solvent depends on the type of the electrolyte that is 
the charges on the ions on dissociation. That is, for example, if you have sodium chloride, when sodium chloride dissociates into the solvent, it gives you any positive and Cl negative. The charges on both sodium and chloride are one positive and one negative. Both the charges are one one. So such uh, electrovalent compounds, which give cation and an ion of one one charge, all of them are kept under one category, one type of compounds, which are known as the one one kind of compounds. So now let us come to the second type. You have CaCl2. You get a cation which has a two positive charge and you get two anions which have one negative charge. So the cation it has a charge of two positive and chlorine chloride ions have a charge of one negative. So what are the two categories of cation and anion? What are the charges that you get? You get two and one. Sorry, I've written it wrong here. It's not one and two. It is two and one. So this type of compounds, all those which give you a uh, charge of the cation as 2 and that of the anion as 1 would be the 2-1 kind of electrovalent compounds or electrolytes. So let us now come to MgSO4. MgSO4 forms both the cation and the anion with 2 positive and 2 negative charge. Therefore, this class of electrolytes would be known as the 2-2 types of electrolytes. All electrolytes of the same type, they have the same value for A. So if you have one one kind of electrolytes, all of them will have a fixed value of A. The two one will have a fixed value. Two two will have a fixed value. So that is how it goes. Now there was a scientist called Kohlroche. And Kohlroche, he examined the limiting molar conductivities of different uh, electrolytes. And he found a certain kind of a regularity between them. What did he notice? Uh, before I come to explaining the coal uh, uh, what uh, the experiments that he conducted, imagine that there's a weighing balance and you're weighing substances. And you take two substances and you want to find which is heavier or which is lighter. But on the two pans, you decide to put one substance which is the same, which has the same weight. So let that be the cation or the anion because we know in an electrovalent compound, there uh, is a cation and an anion. So if I take a cation of a fixed weight here, I put a cation of a fixed weight, the same cation of a fixed weight in the other balance. Now the anion is different. So the difference between the anions will tell you the difference between the weights because the weight of the cation is the same, right? So imagine the weight to be uh, the limiting molar conductivity. And if you now, if you take uh, the same, let us say, cation, uh, the same anion, and the, the cations are different, whatever, you change the ion. And now the difference is because of that changed ion. The one that is fixed, that is contributing to the same weight, or that is contributing to the same limiting molar conductivity. This is what Kohlroche came to the conclusion. And how did he come to this conclusion? He took electrolytes. First, he took a number of electrolytes where the cations were the same and anions were different. And he saw the difference between their limiting molar conductivity. And then he carried out an experiment where he found out the anion was kept to be the same and the cation was changed. And then he compared their limiting molar conductivities. So what did he find out? He examined the molar conductivities, the limiting molar conductivity values for a number of electrolytes. And what did he observe? He observed that the difference in the limiting molar conductivity of sodium halide and potassium halide for any fixed halogen is nearly constant. So he took two cations, that is sodium and potassium, but the anion was constant. So in the two beam balances, he took one anion and he changed the cation. And he found the difference in the weight was due to the difference in the weight of the cation. The anion was not affecting it because the anion was the same on both the sides and therefore its weight was the same. And weight here, I want you to mentally compare it to the limiting molar conductivity. That's what he observed. He took KCl and sodium chloride. So we took, he took chloride as a halogen and potassium and sodium were the same. So limiting, the difference between the limiting molar conductivities of KCl and sodium chloride was almost equal to the limiting molar conductivity of KBr and NaBr. Now potassium and sodium are the same. And the halogen has been changed from chlorine to bromine. 
So from chloride to bromide is the anion and this difference between them was also the same and then when he took iodide as the anion and the same potassium and sodium the difference was again the same and all of these came out to be almost equal to 23.4 simon centimeter square mole inverse or per mole it means what does he understand from this then he carried out the reverse of this that this time he kept the in this case he had kept the anion to be the be the same and the cation was different now he took the cation to be the same and the anion was different. So he took sodium for example and the alkali metals. So he took sodium and sodium and sodium bromide and sodium chloride and he found that the limiting the difference between the limiting molar conductivities of these two was equal to the limiting molar conductivity of potassium bromide and potassium chloride. So this time potassium was common and the bromide and chloride are of course the same and both of these were almost equal to 1.8 simon centimeter square per mole so what did he understand from this that just as we imagine those substances to be separate the ions to be separate balls having their own weights so each ion is like a separate entity which has its own limiting molar conductivity. They are independent of each other. Whatever be the anion, the cation, it retains, it has its own limiting molar conductivity and the anion has its own limiting molar conductivity. So when you keep one of them common, the difference between the other two would obviously be the difference that is there between the other two and they are, they are as if they are not concerned about the presence of the other ion. This shows that once the ions are in solution, their molar conductivity does not, is independent. They are independent. They act as independent entities and their conductivity is a fixed value of that ion. Right? And depending on the stoichiometry of the molecular compound, what is, what is the uh, formula of the compound, how many ions are being produced will decide that, for example, if you have calcium chloride, there's only one mole of calcium which will be produced if you take one mole of calcium chloride. But there will be two moles of chloride ions that will be produced. So whatever is the conductivity of calcium, you will have only one mole of that. But whatever is the molar conduct limiting molar conductivity of chloride, you will have twice that amount because according to the formula you have two moles of chloride ions right so this is what led Kohlrausch to give his law it is known as the Kohlrausch's law of independent migration of ions independent migration movement of ions ions move around as electrolytes and they carry electric current or their conductivity is independent of the presence of other ions each one is independent so what does it say that limiting molar conductivity of an electrolyte can be represented as the sum of the individual contributions of the anion and cation of the electrolyte so they are individual contributions of the anion and the cation. For example, you have lambda naught M NaCl would be equal to the sum of the limiting molar conductivities of the individual ions. Now, whenever we write down the limiting molar conductivity of an ionic compound, if you remember, we use the capital lambda. But when we are talking of single ions, we use small lambda. Right? We do not use, we use the capital letter and the small letter. So, when you are talking about limiting molar conductivity of ions, we use the small alphabet. So, this becomes lambda naught sodium ion plus lambda naught chloride ion. If V positive and V negative are the number of cations and anions produced, that is according to the stoichiometry, it is 2, 1, V positive, how many cations and how many anions. If, if that is how it is, if the number of cations and anions uh, v positive and V negative are the number of cations and anions produced then limiting molar conductivity would be equal to you will have the limiting molar conductivity of that particular ion the cation multiplied by the number of ions produced plus the limiting molar conductivity of the anion and the number of number of anion atoms or sorry anions produced so you get this formula which is lambda naught m is equal to V plus lambda naught, lambda naught plus plus V negative, lambda naught negative. 
I hope I'm clear about what I'm telling you. Now, there are two solved examples in your textbook which I would like to solve right now. And with that, I'm sure this would, the Kohl-Roche's law of independent migration of ions would become very clear to you. So now, before I solve the numerical problem, let me tell you that uh, since we know that the ions have their own individual uh, molar conductivities, it is possible to make a table for a certain temperature like at 298 Kelvin, which is usually the normal room temperature. If you uh, have the values of these ions, the cations and the anions given to us in a table, it becomes very easy to use that information to find out the molar conductivity of an electrolyte. So this table, a few electrolytes that is cations and anions has been given in your textbook. I'll insert a picture of that, uh, look at that and that will help you to solve the numerical problems that I'm going to do right now. Give me a moment. Now this is example 3.7. The question reads that you have to calculate the value of the limiting molar conductivity for calcium chloride and magnesium sulfate from the data that is given in the table. I do not have the table here right here with me so I have written down the values. I have already referred to it and the values of calcium, chloride, magnesium and sulfate I have written them down to help you explain the method. Now we know that lambda naught m is equal to the V plus lambda naught plus plus V negative lambda naught negative right this is what we have just done so the first case is first compound is calcium chloride so we have to find out the lambda naught m value for CaCl2 and here it was for uh, what plus minus I should say so we have CaCl2 now this would be equal to how many moles of calcium is there one mole so you click lambda not of Ca positive plus lambda naught of Cl negative. But how many chloride ions are there? There are two. So according to the formula of the compound, you have a value of V negative which is more than one. So V negative is two, so this will be two. Right? Now substitute the values, the lambda naught values are given to you. Calcium is 119, so you write 119.0 Simon centimeter square mole inverse plus what is the molar conductivity of chloride ion? It is 76.3 and there are two of them, so 2 into 76.3 and the unit remains the same, that is Simon centimeter square mole inverse. From this you will calculate the value of the limiting molar conductivity of calcium chloride and when you do that how, what is the value that you get you will get 271.6 271.6 simon centimeter square mole inverse right come to the second compound now the second compound is magnesium sulfate so you have to find out the limiting molar conductivity of mgso4 and the formula tells us there is one cation, one anion. So this would be equal to lambda naught of mg, lambda naught m of mg, positive, two positive, plus lambda naught m for SO4, two negative. Find it out from the table. Magnesium is 106, 106 and uh, sulfate is 160.0 and both have the units of Simon's centimeter square mole inverse and when you solve this, how much do you get? You get the value would be 266, 266 Simon centimeter square mole inverse right so it's easy all you had to do was what do you understand from the cold rushes independent migration of ions that whatever is the value of the individual ions each one is responsible for its own molar conductivity 
So when you want to find out the molar conductivity, the, uh, the limiting molar conductivity of a solution, all you have to do is find out the limiting molar conductivities of the individual ions and sum all of them up. So it is only a sum of the limiting molar conductivities of each of the ions since they are independent of each other. Now I'll solve one more problem. So here's example 3.8. The question is that the limiting molar conductivity for sodium chloride, hydrochloric acid and sodium acetate are the different values are given Simon centimeter square mole inverse respectively. You have to calculate the limiting molar conductivity for HAC. Now this is an interesting question. Why? Because we know that each ion has its own limiting molar conductivity. But you have not been given the table. In your examination, you've only been given the values of the limiting molar conductivities of the compounds and you are expected to calculate the limiting molar conductivity of a com another compound, which is actually, which actually consists of ions from these compounds whose limiting molar conductivities have been given to you. It's simple mathematics. All you have to do is you need to add up all those compounds which give you the ions that you require. What are the ions that you require in the products? You require hydrogen and you require the acetate ion. So you will use those compounds which have hydrogen and acetate and they should be positive values. And you will subtract all those compounds which would remove any ion which is other than hydrogen and acetate. You get me? So. Now, which are the compounds which have hydrogen and acetate ion? Acetate is present in sodium acetate and hydrogen is present in HCl, right? So let us add HCl plus NaAc, sodium acetate. Now, when we add HCl and NaAc, C should be small. I am getting hydrogen and I am getting acetate. But I do not want the chloride ion and I do not want the sodium ion. So what should I do so that I get only their conductivities should be subtracted? How can I subtract their conductivities? I have been given the value of sodium chloride. So I will subtract the value of molar conductivity of sodium chloride. Now, if you had, we do not want sodium, we do not want chlorine. So sodium and chloride, whatever weights or, or I'm saying weight, limiting molar conductivity they had, if you subtract their limiting molar conductivities, what are you left with? You are left with the molar conductivities of hydrogen and acetate. Do you get me? You had hydrogen, they were combined together. So you could not take, you cannot, you have not been given the limiting molar conductivities of individual ions. You've been given the conductivity of the whole compound. Now you have to, you will take those compounds that you want, but then you will remove those molar conductivities of those ions that you don't want. That is what we did. So HCl plus NaAc will give you NAS, uh, minus NaCl will give you what? Will give you now minus NaCl, NaCl is gone, you will get HAC in the end. So that is what you want. So what do you do now? What is the value for HCl? HCl is 425.9 plus uh, NaAc is 91.0. Minus sodium chloride is 126.4 Simon centimeter square per mole for all of these. And from this, you will get the value for HAC. And what would that be? That would be equal to 390.5. 390.5 Simon centimeter square mole inverse. So that was your solution to example 3.8. I hope with this you understand Cole Roche's law of independent migration of ions and how you can use that table to calculate the values of limiting molar conductivities and what if you're not given the table and you're given certain compounds, how do you use them to find out the limiting molar conductivity of the desired compound? With that, I finished this chap uh, sorry this video. I hope you found it helpful. And if you did, always give it a thumbs up. I love receiving likes. And uh, please recommend it to your friends so that they may also benefit from it. And please keep returning for more videos in chemistry. Thank you for watching and bye-bye for now.